It's really an honor and pleasure for us to have uh, Professor C.N.R. Rao uh, deliver the uh, Ubaid Siddiqui Memorial Oration this year. Uh, Professor Ubaid Siddiqui uh, passed away in 2013. Um, many of us believe that it was an untimely death. Um, for those of you who do not know who Professor Ubaid Siddiqui was, he actually transformed molecular biology research in India by creating the first molecular biology department in the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay. Um, as his able student, Professor Vijayaraghavan, uh, has written, uh, he was a catalyst of a culture of creativity. Uh, indeed, he was a catalyst of the culture of uh, creativity, and he nurtured creativity, and he created uh, the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, uh, where creativity is nurtured even till today. He was a truly inspirational human being, and I can see this from my personal acquaintance with uh, Professor Ubaid Siddiqui. Uh, Professor Siddiqui delivered the first Foundation Day lecture uh, of our institute, the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, and he was a friend of this institute and uh, a true moving spirit behind encouraging the formation of uh, an institute devoted to biomedical genomics research in India. We have Professor C.N.R. Rao, uh, who will deliver the Obed Siddiqui Memorial Oration today. Uh, Professor C.N.R. Rao, I would not even have the audacity to introduce him. Uh, all of us know who he is. Um, and what I decided uh, to do is to introduce him through his own words. So, uh, Professor C.N.R. Rao is a prolific writer, as you know, and he's written on various kinds of topics, and so what I've done is to pick up um, some some of his own from some of his own writings uh, certain passages that actually uh, express our expressions of his own character and his mind. So um, I'm not going to be long, but this is uh, what uh, Professor Rao has written. So he uh, in one of the interviews, uh, uh, and, in, and a, a journalist asked him, uh, "What does one need to do to succeed in science in India?" And this is what his uh, answers were: stamina, tenacity doggedness and perseverance. Also a little intelligence is useful. Uh, there is humor in uh, many of the things that he says and does. Uh, he says, he goes on to say, uh, if you're not, if you're not childlike, you cannot be a scientist. I've concentrated on research every day of my life. And uh, for those of you who do not know, he wakes up at 4.30 a.m. in the morning and is in the lab by 8.30 a.m. Uh, and works till about 4.35 p.m. and then comes back home and again um, starts uh, you know, his own research. On collaboration, he says, collaboration is important but cannot replace one's own efforts. And he goes on to say, I've done most of my work on my own. Your neighbors can't feed you every day. If you want to do good science, you better do it yourself. You go on doing work and improving the quality of your work. There is no other metric or measure other than yourself. You must know how to compete. I keep doing it. There is no end to it. For those of us who follow his work, uh, we know that he means business and he keeps doing and keeps competing every day. We hear a lot about publishing and this is what he has to say about publishing in science. Those who say publishing is bad should not do science. Goes on to say, even now I lay emphasis on publishing papers. I'm not in any race to publish. I don't allow my students to waste time. I worry about everything that they do, and I talk to them every day. Hence, there is more productivity. It is not easy to publish. I consider not publishing as terrible. To me, publishing is an essential part of doing science. And then he goes on to say, we have to fight to survive in science. I still fight with referees, but I manage. And the last point that uh, he says, what, are the, what is the success mantra for our budding researchers? And I specifically made this up or brought it up from one of his writings uh, because I knew that a large number of young people, will, young scientists will be, uh, young scientists and to be scientists will be attending this talk. Um, take interest in what you like. Keep working hard and you will succeed. Those who persevere in India succeed even in India. So uh, with these words, I think that, that lays out uh, what he thinks, how his mind works, etc. And without further ado, it's really a pleasure for us uh, to have him. 
to have him uh, deliver the Omeid Siddiqui Memorial Oration and as you, as all of you know, the oration is titled A Celebration of Science. Uh, again, as I say that uh, we from the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, uh, the various institutions in and around Kalyani and Goyashpur uh, areas and uh, those of us who are present here, thank you very much Professor Rao for accepting our invitation and we look forward to your talk. Professor Sienna Rao. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I thank Dr. Madhundar for having asked me to come here. I've been telling him that I'll visit this place uh, sometime and I've been doing, trying to do so the last two years. I'm very glad to be here. I also am very happy that uh, I'm giving the Obed Siddiqui lecture, a very dear friend of mine. I knew him very, very well and in fact we all started doing things in India around the same time. I remember still when he first joined the AFR to start the molecular biology group and, uh, and it was at that time I used to be a professor at IIT Kanpur and uh, I still remember our old friendship and I, you may not believe it, in fact I, when I recently had met this little accident which uh, took away his life, uh, within an hour I went there to see him, uh, how he was doing, in fact it's a great pity that uh, a minor accident led to his death. Uh, uh, about, about two years, about a year and a half ago. Well, I would like to. Okay, would you, would you want me uh, negotiate things later? Uh, I would like to today talk about celebration of science. I give a general title like that to talk about science. To me, science is, every time you say science, our government or ministers will say science and technology. No, 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 just science. Technology is something we see later. We may not see also. Science is something that comes out of the irrepressible urge of man. It is like writing poetry. Why did Rabindranath Tagore wrote poe started writing poetry at the age of 10 or 12? Did somebody give him money? Was there a government grant? Science is like that. No science will come because of government grants, not because of ministers, prime ministers. With or without them, science will go on. It is that science I'm going to talk about today. Science as an important endeavor of man who in his particular urge to do something different, something, create something new, does something that exciting. And that is the science I'm going to talk about. To do that, I have chosen some examples and some stories. I could pick any other central examples. Today I have picked some, which is unfortunately not all in biology, mainly in physics and chemistry, but uh, uh, I hope this would, uh, you would keep up, with, put up with it, because uh, I am uh, basically a, a person who works in physical sciences, and I have picked examples, keep doing that. About two years ago, about four, five years ago, if you remember, we celebrated the 200th anniversary of Darwin. Then we celebrated the 150th anniversary of J.C. Bose. For those who are here who may not know, J.C. Bose was the first modern scientist of India. Not only just a physicist, but the first modern scientist. Nobody else was there before. And what he did in 1895 in Presidency College, discovering telegraphy in 1895, much before the electron was discovered. The electron was discovered by J.J. Thompson in 1897. Even before the electron was discovered, how did this man in electricity college do what he did? He's an extraordinary scientist. And these are all the things we know. However, I'm not going to talk about them, but I'm coming back to 1911. 2011 was the centenary of the discovery of the structure of the atom by the effort. Unfortunately, nobody celebrated it. In fact, as Feynman said, there is one due to some calamity, some catastrophe, if all knowledge is wiped out of this earth, one fundamental truth would remain, and quoting Feynman, that is that all things in the world are made of atoms. And that structure of the atom was discovered in exactly 100 years ago, 1911. 
this by this great man Lord Rutherford. He was Rutherford, which these two people next to him are Cockcroft and Watson, who built the first pantograph machine, first <coughs> atom smasher. And this man did that in 1911. The world is a more different place. You know, there's nothing more important than that. But the other thing is that atom no, there was no celebration, only discovery, centenary of the atomic structure. But I'm trying to tell you, how major discoveries you assume as if they are there on the time. But it was 100 years ago that he did that. And even now, when you think of an atom, you think of the other part atom. Of course, it's wrong, partly correct, partly wrong, but it doesn't matter. We always think of other part atom, even today. And this is how he looked when he got a Nobel Prize. He got a Nobel Prize in chemistry, you see. And by that, by the time he discovered the atomic structure, he had already got the Nobel Prize because in 1908 he got the Nobel Prize for his investigation of dissenting natural elements. And he used to make fun of chemistry. Oh, chemistry was nothing but collecting stamps, he used to say. You know, as luck would have it, he got the Nobel Prize in chemistry, not in physics. So he said, so you have to go, don't make rash statements like that. So he was, it's, 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 it's so apart. Rutherford was such a great man. One of the greatness about him is he encouraged young people, so many young people, he stopped doing research. You get very bright young men, make them do research, and they would all do major discoveries. And everyone who entered his lab got a Nobel Prize. Chadwick was running around somewhere in London, got him, he discovered the neutron, got a Nobel Prize. Carcraft and Watson put a landing graph, got another Nobel Prize. Kapitza was running around Russia somewhere, got him. He built the first liquidity plant, uh, the low temperature release, the picture got another price. Like that, that's it. It is called the positron, got another number price. So the joke at that time was, don't give the professor of Cavendish about me, Cavendish professor. Never go near the Cavendish lab. The taximen would have been afraid to go there because, I said, we want to talk somewhere else. Uh, Cavendish laboratory, the taxi people would say, I will not uh, take you to a Cavendish lab because we go there. That other that old man will make me do the research, I will end up with the number price. So this taxi will be there. So he was such a great man. This, this today's lecture is all a bunch of stories, please remember. And this, this is again 2011 was exactly 100 years of the discovery superconductor. Nobody celebrated it. I tried my best all over, all over to get an international symposium on superconductivity to celebrate the centenary of the discovery of superconductivity by Camerly Gomes. This is Camerly Gomes in Netherlands. And this is a picture of Camerly Gomes with his guru, Vandal Walsh. Vandal Walsh was a teacher, and this is a picture of the two people. So this, you know, it's very important to see because it's very important to understand how ideas came about in science. Unfortunately, we teach everything, all the junk in the books, we teach our students. We never think we tell them how the ideas actually came out. The creating ideas, or the creation of ideas, the extraordinary people, and the, the stream of knowledge, the stream of the thought process that is responsible for the creation of it, is what makes science what it is, and that is what, what we should be teaching. And what we don't know how to teach that. And the reason I'm telling you this is, that is one reason I'm giving this kind of lecture, to make sure that people realize that. But it's just a picture to show the discovery of superconductivity of mercury, at uh, 4.3 Kelvin, the first record of superconductivity uh, 1911 by common demons. But this is a very important picture. When I used to teach in IIT campus, in my tutorial class, I would hand over this picture. Everyone should identify the people in that. There is the number of marks, I would give the extra marks, the added to the record. If they had to get some more people, we identify one of the two opinions. Professor Samson could like this one, I want to tell you. Because they also don't know, because they never see things. <laughs> this is, why is this important? In 1911, we had the first major scientific conference in the world called the Solvay Conference. The history of science, that the most important scientific meeting that ever occurred in the history of science. You know, if you only needed for 25 people in the world at that time to discover the status of the status of science. And that only time then a lot of things were happening. The structures they had, the X-rays were discovered, radioactivity was given discovered. The whole bunch of things. And this is the picture of the first group of scientists who did this public conference. I hope you can see various people, Adam Curie having a hand in that. 
for those who don't know, he is the one who gave conservation of mass, what chemical composition, compound is a finite composition, he is the one who showed air and oxygen and nitrogen. Very fundamental things. And he is the father of chemistry. Unfortunately, you know, he was a very rich man and he was very close to the royal family. He was Mary Antoinette, Louis XVI, they were all his very good friends. Then there was the French Revolution in 1794. I hope you all know history. Because the French Revolution, they took the king and the queen, they cut off their heads. They killed the, their heads. And along that with the king and the queen, Lavazier's head was also cut off. <coughs> His head was gone down. And they, they didn't realize what a head they were getting because he was such a brilliant man. So he was guilty. And he was the father of chemistry. First to say, what is chemistry? He just gave the idea of atoms for the first time, the atomic theory. That was in 1803. About 200 and odd years ago, when this was in school, even now you read Galton's atomic theory. When we were children in school, then every exam would be one of Galton's postulates. I'm sure even today those questions are being asked and we write the same answer. But this, this is John Galton. Again, it's 19th century science. The reason I'm showing it is most of modern science, idea of atoms, idea of uh, uh, this, uh, chemistry, all came after 18th century. And, then, and, and this is a giant of 19th century. You see, Michael Faraday was born in the 19th century. He died in 19th century, 1867. But he is the greatest chemist, greatest scientist in the history of mankind. No scientist can break the record of Faraday. Doesn't matter what science, biology, physics, it doesn't matter. His record is unbeatable. He had only two years of schooling. And he worked as assistant to a bookbinder. And one day, you see, the way it all started was a person comes to the bookbinder shop and uh, tells this, you know, when I was, talk, was talking to the bookbinder, bookbinder tells this man, Sir, this young boy, Faraday, is very much interested in science. Oh, I saw, I see. He said, if that is the case, you know, I have this three tickets for the lectures given by Humphrey Davy in London <laughs> on chemistry. Maybe he can use it. I'm not going for those lectures. He gives these three tickets to Michael, the bookbinder. Michael Faraday attended these three lectures of Sir Humphrey Davy. He was so excited after these his lectures. He takes these beautiful notes in his handwriting. And then as he comes back, going into the book, a week later, he goes back to Sir Humphrey Davy. Sir, here are your three lectures. I put it in the book and gives it. And as usual, he says, after that, he says, do you think you can give me a job? Of course, as all professors and directors say, there are no vacancy, I'm sorry. You can just make it. And this is the biggest mistake that I've made. Unfortunately, you know, I've made a big mistake. Fortunately, it didn't happen that way. A month later, Sir Humphrey Davis' lab had a little cleaner, one boy who cleaned around the lab, cleaned things in the lab, he runs away. Then he remembers Faraday, why can't Faraday be come and, and he, he takes him as a, to clean around the lab as a pretender, and the title he was given was Chief Bottle Washer. He used to wash all bottles and glassware. That is how he started. And slowly he started helping Davy in his experiments, and improved on his experiments, and started doing experiments, and he, he became so good, he became much better than his teacher. And all the three years of schooling, he didn't know enough English when he started, he didn't know any mathematics. The number of things this man did is unbelievable. Everybody knows class of electrolysis. He is a liquid vacuum of gases, catalysis. He is the one who discovered benzene. This organic chemistry would have given him a Nobel Prize for that. You know, for the inquired molecule, magnetism, diamagnetism, paramagnetism. They're all his words. Electricity he discovered. Of course, the word electrode, anode, cathode, <coughs> all are his words. See, we use them without knowing who gave those words. This is Faraday. And of course, when he discovered electricity, I hope you all know, the Prime Minister of England came. He said, we have discovered electricity. What is the use of that? And he said, sir, what is the use of a newly born baby? He said. So it is like that. And then the Minister of Finance, he asked, uh, not Jaitley, but uh, the minister said. <laughs> and he said, what is the use of that? And he said, sir, someday you will tax it, he said. And there's what electricity will be. No, he would have got, according to Lord Rutherford, at least five or six Nobel Prizes before they did in the 20th century. Nobel Prizes started in the year 1901, 20th century. So he was, a, he was an extraordinary person, simple human being. You see, he showed in life, the, more, the greater you become, simpler 
should you be as a human being? Simplicity and greatness must go together. We never became less like all people because in India, little bit of money, little bit of power, they lose their head completely. <laughs> and when I look in Calcutta, I still have very, very famous for such people. <laughs> so then they come back. But this, this man was unbelievable, you know. For example, the Queen Victoria wrote the letter to him. Dear Mr. Faraday, you have done such a wonderful science. I would like you to be knighted. So you gave him a knighthood. Then you would have become self my confederate. Then he wrote back, hey, dear me, you have all been so gracious, always been so gracious to me. Please don't call me, give me knighthood. Everybody calls me my egg, everybody calls me Faraday. I don't want a knighthood, he doesn't. And in fact, much bigger than that was, he became an FRS. You know, I've been an FRS for 35 years now. And even today, it's not easy to become a fellow of the Royal Society. Those days, he was an FRS with only three years of schooling. And then the Royal Society writes them, we would like you to be fellow of the Royal Society, I mean, a president of the Royal Society. He wrote back the famous letter, thank you very much for thinking me worthy of becoming a president of the Royal Society. You know, my place is the laboratory. How many of us say that? Or my place is else everywhere except the laboratory. That's what we do today. So I, said, I want you to know who built science in the world, people like it. Those of you who are young boys and girls, students, Epidemic. He used to give fantastic lectures to children and college teachers, school children particularly. And he used to always light a candle before he started. Those standard candles burnt exactly one hour. At the end of one hour he would stop and the candle would go off. One hour. And he said nobody has the right to bore anybody for more than one hour. <laughs> that is why you see many teachers don't teach throughout the year. They are giving special classes at the end. Don't ever say Never attend a special class. Anyone who gives more than one hour, you will clean the classroom. So I have to finish now with the class. Well, Faraday was an extraordinary person. Okay, of course, mentally, he discovered a periodic table. And of course, with a mad Russian. Mentally, see, the reason I'm telling these stories is to know how science actually works. Here is a man who gives a periodic table. It was a great thing. And they want to give him a Nobel Prize. Everybody said, actually I read the original. The Nobel Committee said, we should give the Nobel Prize of 1906 to Mendeleev. The last minute, the French people come and say, you know, this year there is another guy called Moisan who has discovered chlorine. He is very ill. Why don't you give him this year? Next year you can try for this. And the last minute they don't give it. I gave it to Moizan for the discovery for it. If you know, luck could have it, it dies also. And so, so if you want to get another price, it must be long. <laughs> don't, don't die very fast, huh? Other young people, I don't, don't die soon. So then they will miss the other price. Well, then coming back to the reason I added this is, people talk about science being done 10,000 years ago, whatever that was. I want to know the truth about chemistry and science. In the first century, we knew exactly seven elements. 16th century, 10 elements. During the early age, we were 23, I'm sorry, not 20, 23 elements during the early age. Today, we have 114, almost 115. Because I put my great teacher, Seaborn, uh, who was my teacher in Berkeley, Seaborn, who discovered most of the artificial elements, like plutonium. I hope you all know what plutonium is for. So this is the story of elements. Chemistry started like that. And this is the periodic table today. And in fact, I gave a lecture in Sweden about it in some connection last year. I told them this is the greatest man-made table. This is the one table which is the greatest table man ever wrote. I think it is this table. That's everything you want. So much information. In my research, I use all the day-to-day basis. I use periodic table for various things. I use it when I to put that here. Things like that. So, this is very important here. People in chemistry have made all kinds of molecules. Again, but historically speaking, first compound was made was so simple in urea in 1828. Till, till 1828, people had not made any chemistry. No more, more compound has ever been made by chemists. So you see why 19th century is important. If people talk about prehistoric science, there was nothing like a chemistry before 19th century. 1828, first compound made. So since then, Lots of compounds have been made. Like, this is the Wohler who made the first compound. 
Then came Woodward and a number of people who made all kinds of interesting things, organic molecules. If somebody asks you, I took examples only in chemistry, similar things in the given by biologists and two lecture of this kind. When did modern chemistry start? When did today's chemistry start? According to me, it started the day we learned to put two electrons between two atoms and call it a chemical bond. Molly, who made it a bigger subject. And this is like Pierre Lewis. I'm showing him with a cigar because he always smoked cigars. He went to his birthday in University of California when he was alive. You knew where the chemistry department was because the, uh, the cigar smell would want to wear the chemistry department was. His was an extraordinary man. G. N. Lewis gave more concepts in chemistry than any other single chemist I know. The idea of chemical bond. He was nominated 20 times for a Nobel Prize because he gave the idea of chemical bond. The Nobel Committee said, I don't think chemical bond is so important in chemistry. Exactly what they wrote. I've seen the original. Amazing. And then he gave the idea of ionic string. He gave the idea, oh, so many. Lewis has its and Lewis base. It's an other than the usual. Act. And people said, I don't think this concept will be accepted by chemists so much. So they didn't give it a prize. He was the first one to do photochemistry in the world. Photochemistry, I don't think, is going to be such an important branch of chemistry. Every time we were nominated, for 30 times, some both story like that. People didn't like him. The reason was, he corrected the mistakes made by the greatest of scientists. And they all hated him. <coughs> for example, Arrhenius had written electrolytic dissociation. He used the word activity and all. I hope you all know the word activity, activity coefficient. He didn't know what it meant. It is Dwayne Lewis who gave what is activity to gas B, activity coefficient. And, and uh, Arrhenius never excluded. None here, this so called none heat theorem. For those who don't know physics and chemistry, I can't help you. None heat theorem is nothing but the third of thermodynamics. It says at, at the zero degree absolute, zero degree Kelvin, zero Kelvin, the free energy will go to zero. That's all it says. According to that. He said, no, that's not correct. Because free energy is equal to H minus TS. The entire thing goes to zero. Free energy will go to zero. But what about entropy? Entropy has to go to zero also. So he showed the corrected null state there to turn off the button. The number of things he did is extraordinary. And if you want to be decent with many people in India, everybody is unhappy in India. But there is one thing. Because whatever you are, there is a wonderful country in that way. We are all one point to million unhappy people. They are all bitter with each one shares it. Every two people meet, they share their misery. There is no people who share happiness like I do. So we can't go away, we can't. In fact, you are a free class, how do you do in this country? Because we will tell you a long story. The reason I am telling you is, if you want to know a story of unhappiness and so on, Uh, in science, G. N. Lewis is a very good example. He was so frustrated and so upset that he was denied a minimum things, a minimum thing called Nobel Prize. Uh, because all his students got it. Job got for third law of thermodynamics. Helen Uri, he discovered deuterium. And when he discovered deuterium, G. N. Lewis said, What is the great thing about the, the deuterium? You have to make a carbon. D2O was made by him in the lab in Berkeley. He's my, uh, in my head. And he in fact used to supply samples of D2O all over the world and uh, published 23 papers at D2O. And eventually, Harold Gray, the number prize was given for deuterium, only Harold Gray was given deuterium, and Lewis. Oh, yes. An extraordinary person. In the end, of course, there's a story that uh, he died in the lab. Well, I had a very great friend of mine who is still alive, I think, I'm not sure. It was 93 last year, uh, uh, Michael Kasha. Michael Kasha is spectroscopy. Michael Kasha was his last PhD student. One morning, G.M. Lewis told him, Michael Kasha, I want you to rule the spectrum of this compound in liquid hydrocyric acid, liquid HCN. Because liquid HCN is very delicate. He said, Carnival, I will not make HCN. It's a big poison. Okay, they make that. No, you don't worry, I will make it for you. You go and have lunch and come back. You go to lunch, when you come back, the laboratory has a bulb, uh, the vacuum line, there is liquid HCF. And the other ampule of liquid is broken, 
entire lab is spinning up bitter almonds. I hope you know. HCL spends some bitter almonds. How do you know? Don't tell me you get his poison. So, in the case, dying sitting in chair. People say he committed suicide. Some people say it was an accident. And I always used to tell my guru, uh, Berkeley, kind of pizza, who was a student, how did he die? Was it an accident or was it suicide? He was such a brilliant man who look uh, suicide to look like an accident. He was like that. In fact, Ben Seagull, who was also a student, Ben Seagull got his PhD in working on movies as it. Ben Seagull always used to send me, you know Ram, my first name is Ram, hey, you know Ram how? He would call me at 8 o'clock, hey Ben, come at 8 o'clock, I want to dictate this paper with you. He would sit down all the data, he would remember every tale, every equation. To tell them, the great Seymour would write. All the students were like that, eight, eight to midnight. And then, uh, when he called him, come and see me at eight o'clock, the man always used to say, I'll well, see you tomorrow at eight o'clock, not tomorrow, tonight, tonight. To make him come and work tonight. Such a great man. The reason I'm giving you this kind of story is, not ever be unhappy. Science is not to get the whole place. Science is because you enjoy it. And if Jim Lewis cannot get it, you have every reason not to get it. <laughs> and this is the other foreign who made chemical bond a famous thing. I saw this essentially by young people. They always see the old guy the white beards and so on, uh, white hair like me. So this is a young like this foreign his wife who made like this the chemical bond whatever it was. And you know he got the Nobel Prize for chemical bond in 1954. But that time Lewis was not there. Okay, but this is what Lewis did. I'm not talking about it. And chemical bonds, the reason I'm showing the next few slides is so what has happened to science? Science is not something that is static. Today, science is not tomorrow's science. Today, science may become tomorrow's technology. Tomorrow's science has nothing to do with today's science. You have to change, you have to adapt, you have to do new things, and therefore, you have to know how to do science. And that's what happened to chemistry. In 1930 to 70, you see, I come, I'm a child of this generation. I was born in early 1930s. In 1950s, I did my PhD. Early late 1950, I joined as a faculty member in engineering of science. Started doing spectroscopy. Spectroscopy was unknown. I still remember, in 1960, I came to Calcutta to give a lecture on infrared spectroscopy. People go, oh, infrared spectroscopy. Oh, in chemistry, it was unknown. And then our spectroscopy was unknown. So it's like that. So we come from that generation <coughs> where structure and chemical bond were very important. However, at that time a very important discovery took place, neither poly made the structure of the alpha helix to the protein, and then was the birth of molecular biology, as Crick says, the line of polling who started molecular biology. The sickle cell anemia, this one, these are the things that the molecules became important in biology and the alpha helical structure. And this is the later polling when he got the Nobel Prize. The new young, you see, is 1954, not 1926, as I showed earlier. So, then you see chemistry was considered to be part of structure, synthesis, and dynamics. And slowly what had happened in my life, see, I started with molecular structures, spectroscopy, doing diffraction. Now, slowly, chemistry started absorbing all of biology. Chemistry has started taking all of advanced years. Today, if you want to be a very great chemist, either you work in one of these two fields. You have to have a biological interest or advanced materials interest. Otherwise, you can do other chemistry, but nobody will read it. Right? Nobody is interested. Right? Please don't be insulted for that. Some of you may not like it. But that's what I believe in. And this kind of change in chemistry took place 30 years ago. See, science is like keep changing. And if you don't want to change, make a really big headache. Go on, go on do that. Don't expect the world to respect you. I don't adore you for that. You have to do so many things. So you can imagine this. We take material, superconductivity, new forms of carbon, nanomaterials, so many new things happening in many other areas. Supramolecular chemistry and so on. I, I still I would show one individual type of the superconductivity because I don't, I don't know if you remember. In 1986, and most of you probably were already here, 1986, December, height of the superconductivity was around. Till then, superconductivity was known up to 23 Kelvin. It 
to be a 35 Kelvin in an oxide, and everybody wanted to do an oxide which is a liquid nitrogen temperature above 70. Uh, of course, we also succeeded in making the first liquid nitrogen superconductor, 90 Kelvin superconductor. Uh, this is nitrogen in nature in 1987. So, that became a very important thing. The reason I'm showing you this, this made a big deal change for chemistry. The National Academy of Science in the US has written a beautiful report which says, the importance of chemistry in the future of materials, advanced materials, was noted because of their contribution to superconductors. All the superconductors are by base of the made by chemists. And then of course, fullerenes got discovered, working walls, new kind of carbon came. You know, what is happening? You know, this is very strange. This never happened in my life before. The new thing again is, just about four, five years ago, the American chemical, I mean, U.S. National Academy of Science came with a new report about what is chemistry today. It no longer types of molecules. You know, molecules are outdated now. It is beyond molecules. Those of you who are interested in biology, you know what self-assembly is, self-organization is, complex systems are, and this is the kind of chemistry we work on. We work on therapies, living systems, optimization as a biological system, synthesis, of course, still self-assembly, complex chemistry, chemistry of the earth, chemistry of the sea, chemistry of atmosphere, materials by design, and computation. Today, computation, of course, is so powerful that they are as good as experiments. So it's better than experiments sometimes. They can calculate everything. And last year, Nobel Prize in chemistry, two of them are very close friends of mine. I told him, how did you get Nobel Prize? The computer is going to it, not you. And he said, why do you say that? You know, they got free time on the NSF computer. My friend who did the protein work on the myomycin and all. And he showed, you know, it moves like that, how it drags its feet while moving, moving. You know, then he calculated because of the computer. It's his own contribution in that is very small. If they write the program at the computer, the calculate. See, we don't have such computers today. Computers are completely revolutionized science, particularly uh, biological and chemical sciences. Well, I would like to say a few words. You know, people worry about what is it you should do. In fact, young people, what are you should write? What are you should do? You know, don't go on repeating your own thing, you know. Uh, all this, uh, repeating your father, your grandfather, your poor doctor, or whatever you work, the same thing, go on doing it. Uh, I think you should find new things. In fact, there's so many challenges in the new tech, energy, and environment, which are very, very, very important today for everything. Uh, there is something wrong with the machine. Uh, a hydrogen important area. So a lot of work on solar cell, a lot of work in every one of these areas. The catalysis for emission control. Hydrogen, for example, is very important. I hope you all know artificial photosynthesis has been declared as a national mission last month in the United States. I think we should be working on that. Of course, what, what is the artificial synthesis? Well, I started working on it last two years. I'm having very exciting results. Today, I'm not even a technical seminar. It will be very wonderful. I hope you all know you can take the water. Of course, the photosynthesis, water in the air is taken by the leaf in a particular active site in a, in a, in a, in a chlorophyll. It is decomposed in some way. Water gets oxidized with oxygen. And eventually, reduction takes place in the second photosystem, photosystem one, the photosystem two oxidation like this, and so on, giving the oxygen to breathe. And all that we can do in the semiconductor structures. But in my lab, I have just a hundred watt now using my semiconductor structure. Yes, like the lab, boom, 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 boom. And what is the thing? We need to make discoveries of a kind that is not only useful because it's exciting, it's also useful because it is related to man's future. Well, I want to show you I was in 1874, Jules Verne had written, and this is what he had written in a, in a book. 1874, thank you. And why will the Verne should have called at Pencraft, water replied hardly, but water decomposed into its primitive elements. Yes, my friends, I believe that water will one day be employed as fuel, that hydrogen and oxygen which constitute it will furnish and make such tools so that we can light. Water will be the core of the future. Well, you know, this is an exciting problem. The reason I give you this example, I am giving one example. To show that science has so many possibilities today, we can work on. Hydrogen, we can make by a number of methods. 
Yeah. 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 You have to do every time, every minute. If you are really interested in science, when you are sing, sleeping, when you are talking, when you are listening to music, something that will worry you about something that you are doing in the lab. It is a constant vision, constant expectation, constant pursuit. Science is one of those. To me it is. In fact, it is only a, a something that absorbs your time for eight hours a day. Uh, it is okay, you can do that, but it is not. In fact, it's, a, it's always the case. Yesterday's rice is today, it is stale. So you have to find new food all the time. Same is true of science. The passion commitment I, I talked about earlier, but that Madhinda mentioned, are very, very important. But unfortunately, we do not have enough people in India with that passion and commitment. What India really needs is a bunch of mad guys. Too many normal fellows. But in the old days in Calcutta, there were lots of mad guys around. <laughs> now they all become normal. They are few fighting in the legislative assembly and all. The real mad guys of Calcutta are the ones who made Bengal Renaissance. Bengal Renaissance, the greatest thing that happened in India's history. Who, who made that? The normal people would have been eating Rasulullah and keep it quiet. <laughs> and this we need more of them. And that is required for science. Remember our legacy. You see, I did my MSc thesis in Banaras with a professor. And he got his PhD, a BSc, whatever he did in London with a professor in University College, London. And he came, he worked actually, got his PhD under Aswad, the father of pharmaceutical chemistry. So I consider Aswad a great great man. I got my PhD under a professor who got his PhD under Linus Pauling. So Linus Pauling is my grandfather. I don't laugh, not for laughing. A very serious matter, please think about it. And then I got my fourth doctor with a professor in Berkeley who was student of J.L. Lewis. J.L. Lewis is also my grandfather. The reason I got it is not technically saying grandfather, father, mother, but not that. That you know, through the spirit of science that flows through. I'll never forget J.L. Lewis. That is my academic, academic grandfather. The, what he stood for, what he breathed, what he dreamt is part of my life. So when you do science, remember that. Your own immediate teacher, your own immediate neighborhood may not. But you go back to history, the legacy of science, the legacy that you have is really fantastic. And more than that, science also gives you a lot of things. It gives you immortality. I hope you all know that. Of course, somebody, the famous, Eknavalka, the famous in the, in the Upanishad story, his wife Maitri asked Eknavalka, my dear husband, what makes me immortal? Suppose I become the richest woman on earth, will I be immortal? Ignore all that answer. No, my dear wife. Nothing like that will ever be immortal. But if you want immortality, it has to be to goddess and knowledge. So, I think science is wonderful. More than that, in my life, I tell you, is the actual truth. Somehow, we become unselfish. If a real scientist, your own self becomes less important, you become more and more selfless. I hope you know in Gita Anjali, in poem number 30, I read the English translation of Rabbi Tagore. He says, I came out alone on my way to my twist, but who is this that follows me in the silent dark? I move aside to avoid his presence, but I escape him not. He makes the dust rise from the earth with the swagger. He adds his loud voice. Every word that I utter, he is my own little self, my lord. He knows no shame, but I am ashamed to come to thy door in his company. That is selfishness, that self. I think we all live in this world of Gautam Buddha to lose a little bit of self. To me, the truth, science is the only way for me. I have no time to be selfish. I have no time to be to tell lies. Tell my wife I've been married for 55 years now. I've never entered a lie. I don't see why do you have to lie. In fact, that brought me to a bit of a trouble sometimes. <laughs> if somebody says it seems to be wrong, 
You said I'm not very good. Yes, I'm afraid. So you, I did say you are not very good. I can't say no. I said you are very good. I, I, I there, you know, I'm not good. So I don't think much of somebody. I tell him that sorry. Very very important. Honesty, integrity, selflessness. These are the natural daughters of self. Unfortunately, I have forgotten that. So for those, the reason I am telling you this is because I am one of the young people. The old people may laugh at what I say, but don't forget what I said. We need more selfless, more righteous, more truthful people to do science. Well, unfortunately what is happening is this. We are, in India, we are losing time. See, India can become great if we work hard, but on a day-to-day -day basis, every hour, every day. There are no holidays in India. If India has to come up. You know, India wants 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we'll be that. How will you be? Why will you be that the way we are doing? Well, I always remember Michael Faraday, I read out. A little, Michael Faraday once wrote some, got a recent letter from his friend. Dear Michael, Mr. Dear Michael, I have not heard from you for a long time, I never tried my letters. And he says, you know, it's, it's because of the time I don't have. Then he writes about time. This is what he writes. What is the longest and the shortest thing in the world? The swiftest and the most slow. The most divisible and the most extended. The least valued and the most regretted. Without which nothing can be done. And which devours all that is small. And gives life and spirit to everything that is great. What is it that the creator thought was so valuable? He gave only a limited amount. Time. <coughs> a very limited amount of time. See, if I have 500 years to live, I would have planned a different life. I have only 100 years. I am already 81. I think I count the number of years now. One hand, probably maybe two hands, I don't know. So we have to do something fast as individuals. But it was something as a country. Don't forget. Science is that unbelievable spirit, unbelievable thing that gives you spirit, unbelievable force that can make you selfless, unbelievable thing that make you worth living, unbelievable thing that make you happy. As I told you, I don't know anyone as happy as I am. I didn't see anyone very happy yet. <laughs> Happiness part. Science is important. In fact, I would like to go in my lecture. Suddenly I remembered. A few months ago, my wife showed me this fantastic, you know, we, are, we love music a lot. I have a great fan of classical music. Ajay Chakravarti is a very close friend of mine, for example. You know, uh, Bismillah Khan, who I used to know when I was a young student in Benares, he used to sat, sit in the front of Ganges and keep on playing his shana. I'll never forget it. I used to invite him. And he would come and then, they would ask for never ask for money. I never paid one rupee even. I never come at all and put, and he would give us some free food with the hospital and all. And the other day, just before he died, I met him, this man has had, I said, and I went, yes, yes, I would, yeah. So, things are paid here, he would say, I'm going to He couldn't sit because he had, like, the orchids are reminded of the hospital. He would sit on the chair. It's a poor guy, Bhagavan, it's a Pratna, it's a Muslim guy. Pratna means he's playing at Allah. He said, I, I, his quotation, my wife showed this to me. Somebody asked him before he died, Kansa, what is it you will pray to God? What will you pray to God? And I make God, as long as I am alive, let me be in the world of music. That is his prayer. I feel the same way. Oh God, let me be the world of science to the last day. And I still remember Gurudev, Ravindra Nathagore, who gave him a poem of Pitanjali. He said, you remember, the end has come, I've locked the door, handed over the keys, time has come to say goodbye. The only thing that I worry about, he says in Pitanjali, that the world has done so much for me, have I done enough for this world? I think the same way about science. The science has done so much for me, have I done enough for science? Thank you.
So it was of course awesome and that's uh, what we expect from Professor C.N.R. Rao. Um, the legacy and the spirit is what we'll all uh, go out from this hall with. And uh, we of course should make a promise to him that uh, we will breathe science. Uh, thank you very much Professor Rao, it was absolutely wonderful and again as I said, we are absolutely delighted, honored that you can be here and uh, deliver the Obed Siddiqui Memorial Oration. Uh, Professor Siena Rao also, uh, while we were traveling from the airport to here, said that, uh, suggested that we should begin a lecture series called The Celebration of Science. And uh, I, uh, on my part as the director of the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, uh, is happy to uh, accede to his uh, suggestion and begin today a lecture series called Celebration of Science, and we will organize it through the year and have multiple uh, people come in and um, uh, narrate to us what science means, how to celebrate science. Thank you very much, Professor Rao, for that suggestion. Um, I have the honor and pleasure of uh, uh, providing to Dr. Rao a small memento. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all of my colleagues, the NIBMG family, for um, taking the trouble of organizing all of this and particularly grateful to uh, uh, Professor Bhattacharya, the uh, principal of uh, the College of Medicine. Whenever we descend on him, he is so gracious and uh, permits us to use the facilities of his institution. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya, thank you very much. I'm also very grateful to uh, the uh, directors and vice chancellors of uh, adjacent neighboring uh, institutions with whom we uh, collaborate, with whom we join hands in doing these uh, um, you know, events together. I'm very glad that they can be here and uh, I'm glad they, that they can uh, encourage their students and faculty members to come and join the celebrations. Today was a celebration of science and we will celebrate year long. Thank you very much, Professor Rao. Thank you all.